Hey, welcome back to another podcast on family and groups developments. Tonight we're going to be looking at uh, the different groups and their characteristics. So what do you think of when you think of family? Do you think of your own family? That's probably a good starting point. Uh, you may think of uh, famous families that are on TV. Um, but if, you, if you're thinking about the word family, you're thinking about a group of people. Uh, in this case, we're talking about elements, but a group that has something in common. And uh, my first thought for family, strangely enough, is uh, probably the most famous cartoon family, The Simpsons. That's boring. You're boring, everybody. Quit boring, everyone. Uh, the Simpsons are all alike, but they're not exactly alike. Uh, they all have the same yellowish tan skin color. They all have four fingers. And they all kind of have a, a good ability to get in trouble. Um, so it's kind of like an almost reactivity. So you'll see this with the alkali metals. Most of the alkali metals are extremely reactive with water. Uh, and some are very reactive, but not as reactive as others. So we're actually going to take a look at a video uh, later on. Uh, so some things to keep in mind when we're talking about um, those properties that families share. We're looking at chem chemical and physical properties. And we've looked at some of these in the lab. We've looked at density. Um, we've looked at conductivity. we looked at reactivity. Um, and we have talked about valence electrons. So these should be some uh, similar terms that you've looked at. Keep in mind that those families come in vertical columns, so those are the 18 columns across as we... Every time I learn something new, it pushes some old stuff out of my brain. The first uh, family we're going to take a look at is uh, the alkali metals. The alkali metals are very reactive, uh, like we just mentioned in the previous slide. If you take a look at that video to the right there, uh, you can see that the alkali metals react very strongly with water. Just keep an eye on that as, as I'm going through this. Uh, they're shiny, they're soft, they're malleable. Remember that means they're smashed into sheets. They have low density. You can see they, they float on water there as they're placed on water. And they have one valence electrons. We'll get to valence electrons later on. Group two is the alkaline earth metals. Uh, they're the second most reactive group of metals. Uh, they're not quite as reactive as alkaline metals. You can see there when they're placed in water uh, they do not have that same uh, reactive <clears throat> capability that the alkali metals do. They do share some similar properties to them, though. They're low in density, they have malleability, they're soft, you can cut them very easily with a knife. Um, and they, they do like to give away their electrons, just like the alkali metals also. And again, we'll get into that later in this podcast. Groups 3 through 12 are the transition metals, so now you see that it's not just one column that can be a group. There are multiple columns together that can be groups. Um, when they share similarities, and you can see some of the similarities right there, um, then they can be a group. So we have uh, metallic luster. These are the metals that you typically think of when you think of a metal like iron and copper and gold and silver. Um, they're malleable, which you should know that word. They smash into sheets. They're ductile, means they get pulled into wires. Um, they're dense. These are a lot more dense than the other two metals that we talked about in the previous slides. And they're very good conductors, and we'll get into why that is towards the end of this podcast. Taken out of the transition metals and placed below the periodic table are your lanthanides and actinides. And these begin with the uh, elements lanthanum and actinum um, down below there. And you can see these would actually go in periods 6 and 7. But for convenience sake, we put them down below the graph. Um, these are commonly called the inner transition metals, um, not just the lanthanide and actinide series. Uh, they're pretty reactive for the transition metals, and those actinides are radioactive, and many are man-made. Uh, we, we'll get into that process later in class, but uh, these are not found naturally. Groups 13 through 16 don't really have special names that we're going to get into. Uh, we'll just call those the boron, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen groups. And these uh, share some similarities, but not a whole lot. They're a mixture of metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. The main similarities that they share is that they have the same number of valence electrons. And this is actually pretty simple. Um, their number of valence electrons will be the same as the ones 
place digit in the group. So for example, group 13 would have three valence electrons. Group 14 would have four valence electrons. Group 15 would have five valence electrons. Group 16 would have six valence electrons. Group 17 are the halogens. These are the very reactive nonmetals. Group uh, 17 has seven valence electrons, so that trend continues from 13 through 16, where you take the ones place of that number, and that's your number of valence electrons. Um, these are one away from having a full shell, and we'll get to that, and that's why they're, they're very reactive. These like to combine with the alkali metals, and if you think about that, um, think about why that might be when the alkali metals have one valence electrons and the halogens have seven. There's a reason why they like to come together. And the last group we're going to look at here are the noble gases. And like it says there, yes, they're obviously gases. Um, they're called noble because nobility, kings, queens, uh, they don't mix with the common people. So they started calling them the noble gases because these gases don't like to mix or combine with other elements. They're not very reactive. Uh, these are commonly used in neon lights. They'll get electrically charged, and we talked about that last chapter in the form of plasma. So those electrons get excited, and they get moving uh, through their energy shells, and we get light uh, from that excited electron. The way the electrons are configured in the atom of the element will uh, control its conductivity. If they're very free and they move around, like in metals, uh, where they'll move from atom to atom and, and be shared, um, that's called metallic bonding. Uh, but those, those electrons will move through very quickly through the metal or metalloid. In a non-metal, they don't move as much, and so we get uh, electrons that, that aren't going to move from one atom to the next, and so you get what's called an insulator, which is the opposite of a conductor. But those electrons will also determine how reactive something is by their valence electrons. And the valence electrons, they want to have eight full electrons on the outside. So they want to try to get to a full shell in the valence, which would be eight. And so what we have here is that elements that have seven are very eager to get to eight. So they're very reactive, just like those halogens are. Elements that have one valence electron, so like the alkali metals, are very eager to get rid of that one because then their outside layer will be full. And so we have these electrons on the outside that get moved from atom uh, to atom because those electrons, uh, there, that atom is, is trying to get to where it's stable, and it's, it's stable when it has a full shell on the outside. So complete your six sheet. Um, that went really fast for me. I didn't. I don't know if I'm close to eight minutes or not here. Uh, I tried, and as Will Ferrell would say, "Boy, that escalated quickly." <laughs>